All right, welcome to lecture 23. Uh, we're going to wrap up a discussion of cannabis and CBD by talking about some of the physiological and psychological effects of these products, primarily focusing on cannabis and THC, but we'll talk a little bit about some of the potential benefits of uh, CBD. So we'll start with uh, cannabis and uh, THC. There are some pulmonary effects of THC. It's primarily a bronchodilator initially, uh, then it may actually constrict uh, bronchi. Can impair lung function primarily due to smoking because um, intravenous THC does not affect lung functioning. Um, so be cautious of that if uh, you have asthma or whatever, perhaps edibles might be a better choice. Uh, questions about lung cancer? Uh, it's too early to tell. Uh, a lot of THC users in the past also smoked tobacco, so dissociating the effects of those two was rather difficult. But at this point, it appears to be certainly less carcinogenic uh, than the commercially produced uh, tobacco was. In terms of cardiovascular effects, uh, the, it would be no surprise to anyone that this dilates the small blood vessels in the whites of your eye, which is why people who smoke have such bloodshot eyes. Increased blood pressure and heart rate. It might be frightening to a novice, but you become tolerant after a while. It has been shown to decrease intraocular pressure um, there's no tolerance to this, and there are some eye drops under testing. I will say that um, the American Academy of Ophthalmology uh, does not support the use of marijuana to treat glaucoma, so keep that in mind. Uh, the peripheral CBT, CB2 receptors in the heart might be protect, protective against ischemic damage, so it's possible there may be some cardiac benefits uh, by affecting those peripheral CB2 receptors. Uh, again, a lot of this is unclear because we simply don't have uh, sufficient data. So we're still gathering lots and lots of data now that it's uh, a little bit more available. Uh, so there is no depression of respiration. Uh, there's no known overdose deaths. Uh, it does not uh, suppress respiration like a lot of other drugs, particularly those to treat pain or anxiety. In terms of the reproductive system, there may be a slight decrease in testosterone and in other female hormone levels, estrogens and progesterones. Uh, but recovery does occur. Uh, THC can cross the placenta, not known if it has much effect or has any effects as a teratogen. There is mild fetal growth reduction and some maternal lung damage. Uh, again, it's about making decisions, and this is one of those unknowns, no, unknown areas, so it's probably best uh, to consider uh, not smoking marijuana while pregnant. In terms of the immune system, there's no consistent impairment in healthy subjects. Uh, there's no evidence you, that users are more susceptible to infections. People with weak immune systems, it's not clear. Uh, however, we have seen um, use of marijuana to uh, combat AIDS wasting uh, in patients who uh, have not been successful in treating their HIV. Uh, and so there are some potential benefits uh, for that population. Uh, we do know that uh, THC is effective against nausea and vomiting. Um, inhalation appears to be better than oral uh, preparations, but sometimes there are problems with smoking. Some people find the smoking a little nauseating, so you know some vape products might be available. Tolerance to that does develop, um, but we have seen successful use of uh, THC to mitigate the side effects of chemotherapy. So it's uh, it's certainly something to consider uh, as a way to mitigate those side effects. You know, of course, <laughs> marijuana affects appetite. Um, you can get dry mouth, uh, be thirsty. Certainly increased consumption of snack food. This may depend on the setting or the dose. Uh, I do love my home state of Colorado, uh, where um, <laughs> some enterprising young uh, Girl Scouts set up a Girl Scout cookie stand right outside a dispensary. Uh, you can get a little ataxia and muscle weakness, tremor, uh, as a result of use. Uh, it may, uh, however, also be useful as an antispasmodic. That is a muscle relaxant. So for somebody who has a seized muscle um, of some kind, this may be useful to loosening up that muscle. Um, certainly, there are more powerful versions. Uh, muscle relaxers, Valium is a very powerful mu muscle relaxer. But um, marijuana certainly may be uh, an appropriate use for that. In terms of the psychological effects of THC, there are certainly some functional effects. Uh, impairment of driving, for example, decreased attention and concentration. Obviously, that's a big problem for 
uh, driving. People are easily distracted. Uh, there's no consistent evidence of enhancement of creativity. I think oftentimes what happens is people feel more creative because they're not concentrating and so they're, they're unable to inhibit irrelevant thoughts and sometimes something, two weird thoughts pop up together. Um, some decreased visual perception, particularly peripheral vision. Uh, there is certainly decreased pain perception. This is one of the reasons why it's thought to uh, be good for treating chronic pain. Some decreased time perception. We people tend to overestimate the passage of time. Short-term memory can be impaired. Uh, and part of this is what we call temporal disintegration. It's lost of the ability to retain and coordinate information for a purpose. Um, and so trying to focus on something and keep, uh, keep on task can be very difficult um, for some. And everyone's a little bit different, so you want to think about um, what, if this is a drug you choose to use, think about what works for you, make sure you're keeping things um, appropriate, not forgetting to do things that you're supposed to do, uh, etc. In terms of the subjective effects, low to moderate doses, relaxation, dreaming, maybe introspective, laughter, I get the giggles, certainly. Sometimes you can get mood swings to anxiety and or panic at higher doses, so watch out for that. Uh, more than any other known drug, uh, the effects are modulated by our surroundings. So, uh, for example, self-recorded mood ratings are correlated with the mood of others. And so you want to be, of course, mindful of that as well uh, in terms of, uh, of use of this drug. As I've said before, uh, it's all about making good choices that are appropriate for you. Uh, and not uh, listening to what other people tell you. So make good choices and just think about these things and make decisions for yourself. Um, there's no evidence that long-term use of cannabis produces damage. There is some concerns about developmental effects uh, of cannabis. So we really wanna try to keep um, cannabis out of the uh, hands of kids, teenagers, um, primarily to allow those brains to develop uh, without the presence of Seven months after exposure, there's no detectable differences in behavior, hippocampal volume, neuron size, or synaptic and dendritic anatomy. So it appears to be uh, not causing any kind of uh, significant brain damage. There's no systematic data to support causal relationship between cannabis and aggression. Uh, this is one of those uh, falsehoods that uh, gets spread, uh, mostly because of the drug turf wars uh, of the sort of 70s and 80s. And that's uh, something we have to be mindful of is oftentimes the uh, violence and aggression associated with drugs has to do with their trade, <coughs> excuse me, their trade, not with their use. Um, and so uh, that's one of the arguments towards legalization. Uh, studies that find correlations, cannabis tends to be associated with decreases in violence. People tend to be more peaceful, quiet, a little bit more sedate, uh, certainly far less prone to um, associations with violence than with alcohol. One of the biggest issues uh, is marijuana and driving. Um, the percentage of 12th graders who reported using marijuana in cars was higher than those that reported using alcohol in cars. 13% um, versus 10%, not a huge difference. Well, it's a 30% increase, I guess. Um, Certainly, this is a major issue. Um, I can tell you Colorado car insurance rates are enormous, and the insurance company tries to blame that on legal marijuana. Uh, there hasn't been an increased spate in accidents because of marijuana, so I think it's just uh, that's there trying to get more money out of us. Um, Colorado is the first state to try to limit THC levels while driving. The problem is how to quantify use. We, there's no breathalyzer. Um, trying to figure out how to test for, due to roadside sobriety test for marijuana is a whole other problem. So this is a, a real issue uh, that uh, needs some, some uh, way to uh, try to figure out how to quantify use if we're going to try to uh, keep people safe on the road. So, you know, best to just stay home if you're smoking weed. You see that as THC concentrations increase, uh, we tend to get pretty significantly impaired test results. Um, and they sort of uh, top out at about 60% impairment after about 10 nanograms per milliliter. It's a pretty clear dose response relationship. Um, so tolerance develops readily in animals to the physiological and behavioral effects, but it does require high doses. 
And in humans, it seems to require high doses and chronic use. Uh, so in one study, um, we got tolerance to the high, um, the heart rate increase, cognitive and motor impairment, and et cetera. Uh, this was every four hours for 12 days. That's a lot of weed. Um, <laughs> it lasted for about a week off the drug. Uh, tolerance did not occur uh, to a joint uh, a day for 28 days. So you got to smoke a lot in order to get high tolerance. And that tolerance is not due to changes in pharmacokinetics. It's due to the downregulation and desensitization of cannabis receptors. So tolerance to THC is occurring in the brain by altering the regulation of the response uh, to those cannabinoid receptors. Uh, and it doesn't last very long. And so that's important to keep in mind. And it's really no evidence that uh, marijuana is addictive. There seem to be mild to moderate withdrawal symptoms um, in about 50 to 60 percent of regular users. They tend to be affective and behavioral, things like anxiety, irritability, maybe reduced appetite, uh, reduced food consumption. Some of the anxiety may be due just simply to those cannabinoid receptors resetting. Some of it may just be that the anxiety was there already and uh, users were using marijuana to cope with the anxiety may contribute to continued use. So there's no pharmacological property of the drug, but there's just an emotional um, component to um, smoking marijuana. So there's no physical dependence occurring. Uh, it's just simply emotional regulation. That gets us to possible therapeutic uses of medical marijuana. Um, certainly it acts as an anti-emetic to treat nausea and vomiting. Can be used as an ap appetite stimul stimulant in patients with wasting diseases. Uh, there was an attempt during the AIDS crisis to use Marinol uh, to increase appetites in patients. Uh, there is some belief that uh, brain protection following head injury can occur with uh, marijuana use. And we see that in those um, CB2 receptors uh, in the uh, microglia, which might be uh, beneficial for following head injury. Uh, spasticity, secondary to neurological diseases, so spasticity in the muscles. Um, may be affected. So again, um, an antispasmodic uh, quantities. This is where I think uh, there is a lot of uh, potential use for marijuana is in chronic pain syndromes. So visceral pain, such as interstitial cystitis, uh, and the pain of multiple sclerosis. And in fact, Canada has approved Sativex uh, to treat multiple sclerosis patients. Um, and there is some evidence that other types of peripheral neuropathy and chronic pain can be treated with marijuana. Um, so here's a nice summary of uh, some of these areas. Bronchodilation, probably not the best treatment for asthma because it can result in constriction of the bronchi. Um, again, decreased muscle spasticity and ataxia and muscle weakness, uh, some analgesia, some appetite stimulation, and the anti -emetic. So Sativex is the world's first natural whole plant marijuana extract, extract pharmaceutical. Uh, it's been approved in Canada to relieve pain from multiple sclerosis. It's also an effective analgesic for neuropathic pain, and the manufacturer is seeking FDA approval in the United States. Um, this is sort of the problem. The FDA would have to concede that the cannabis plant has medical value. It would have to be rescheduled by the um, Drug Enforcement Agency or by the Attorney General. Um, and so we'd have to consider whether or not uh, the attorney general at the time would consider that. So it's a, it's a yeah, it's, it's a tough road uh, to go in the United States. I want to stop for a minute and talk a little bit about legalization. Currently, uh, recreational marijuana is legal in 10 states. Medical marijuana is legal in 33 states. Um, with uh, varying uh, levels of success, um, I want to talk about some pros and cons of legalizing marijuana. Uh, the cost of prevention is high, so it could be spent more usefully. The war on drugs has cost us a lot of money. Uh, we can reduce the influence of organized crime uh, to a significant extent. Taxes can be generated for useful purposes, and I'll show you the taxes generated by the state of Colorado here in a moment. There is an individual freedom argument to be, to be made, uh, certainly a libertarian type of argument. Uh, we certainly know legalization does not lead to an explosion of drug use. It actually oftentimes reduces popularity. So Portugal has legalized every single drug. Um, they're available uh, pretty much where you'd like them. And they've found reductions in drug use and reductions in um, 
uh, addiction, primarily because uh, for drugs like heroin, you have to get them from the government and use them under government supervision. And they've been able to get people off drugs. Um, and then finally, the purity and safety of drugs is guaranteed. Uh, currently in the United States, we have a crisis of drugs being contaminated with fentanyl um, by suppliers. And so as a result, people are overdosing on heroin because it's laced with fentanyl and even cocaine being laced with fentanyl. And so uh, there's something to be said for guaranteeing the safety of the population. And then you get sort of re regain some respect for the law because we're not legislating morality. And let's face it, talking about marijuana use is a, is more a morality argument, not a legal argument. To give you an idea of how much money can be generated by uh, marijuana taxes. Since 2004, uh, when marijuana was legalized in the state of Colorado, uh, up through April of this year, they have collected $993 billion, sorry, million dollars, um, in taxes. So almost a billion dollars, and probably it's, we've probably reached a billion at this point. Um, so in any given year, the state of Colorado is collecting a little over $2 million in tax revenue a month. Um, and that's, uh, a pretty significant amount, a pretty significant revenue source that's going to the state of Colorado instead of a cartel in Mexico. Some cons, most citizens don't want the laws reduced. That's actually changed. Actually, most people do want legal marijuana. Uh, people believe greater availability would lead to increased use, that it would increase health costs, um, that drug taking is not entirely private and the right to privacy is not relevant, that freedom argument. Um, People believe there's a danger to non-users of people intoxicated at work. That's a workplace issue. People show up to work drunk too. Um, we get to this question of whether or not drug or crime goes away. I can say in Colorado, one of the biggest issues is that medical marijuana dispensaries aren't allowed into the banking system. As a result, they're cash only businesses. And that is where the crime comes from, is targeting these cash only businesses. Um, so there's some question about well, should we waste more land on growing cannabis? Um, that's a, a good question. Uh, then the state does get money from confiscating resources of drug sellers. I don't think uh, Colorado would get to a billion dollars in seized resources. So, um, you know, these are the pros and cons. I think everyone should make their own decision. About these. There are some issues that we really need to think about. Um, certainly, regulation of production is an important question. Um, so, for example, there are like pesticides and herbicides uh, aren't approved for use on cannabis plants, and so trying to figure out what you, how to grow them in a legal way. Um, regulation of the distribution, setting up a distribution system. Banking and financing is a whole another problem. Uh, in particular, it, there are a number of gray areas. So, currently. Um, Marijuana businesses are not allowed uh, are not allowed into the banking uh, system because that's controlled by the federal government. The other problem we have right now is um, hemp and CBD products, which are legal to grow in the United States under the nineteen or the two thousand eighteen Farm Act. Um, but a number of people I know who are trying to start hemp businesses are getting turned away by their banks because they're saying that the bank can't accept hemp money, and so this is a huge area of confusion that really needs to be fixed. Of course, we also have issues involving intoxication. How do we set legal limits? What do we do about workplace safety? And all of this is just to say that we need to do more research. We need more data. We certainly need to let these businesses into the banking industry um, to make people safer. Uh, it will certainly allow tracking of money. Um, so people talk about there being potential corruption in this business. Well, when you don't let them have bank accounts, of course, there's much greater potential for corruption. So I'm going to finish with talking about CBD oil. Um, there's a lot of hype surrounding CBD oil, and I always, I'm always cautious when something uh, comes up that's some sort of miracle cure. Uh, I mean, I'm just a good skeptic. But I will say this. There is some really good data to support uh, the use of CBD products for anxiety. Uh, the data there is really quite, uh, quite good that uh, CBD is a, a useful tool for reducing anxiety for people with PTSD, uh, etc. Another area which it has shown uh, really good data for is chronic pain and inflammation. Uh, and in fact, there are preparations available for dogs, for example, and people report 
having really great success uh, with those um, CBD products for dogs. So that chronic pain and inflammation, particularly inflammation associated with things like arthritis, appears to really um, be helped by CBD oil. There's an open question about whether or not CBD is useful for insomnia. I think when insomnia is secondary to anxiety, it certainly uh, can have that effect. Um, the data is just not as clear, but I think it's, it's probably a good bet and certainly probably better than any other type of sleep medication. So there are some really great uses for CBD oil. It's not a miracle cure, but it certainly is, is associated with uh, these uh, issues, and there is good data to support its use in these areas. All right, well, that's uh, our discussion of CBD and THC. Um, make smart decisions uh, and uh, make them based on uh, your own priorities and, and what you believe.